Talking now, Stairs, a leading economic analysis and data-driven insights provider, has called for proactive measures to safeguard the nation's economic stability from inflationary pressures in 2024. In its 2024 African Output Report, it noted that Nigeria is currently grappling with high headline inflation rate and the Central Bank of Nigeria is expected to continue with its tightening policy in the near term to address the inflationary pressures effectively. For more perspective on this, I'm being joined live in the studio by a senior economist at STIRS, uh, Mrs. Dumebi Oluwale. Thank you so much, Dumebi. It's good to have you on the program. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, interesting <laughs> stuff. But I saw that report, like I said earlier, behind the cameras. Great work, Thank I must you. say. Thank yeah. You. But let's start with the projected growth figures and what we have seen across the board. Yeah. How feasible is this considering all the challenges, not just domestic, global ones. Yeah. Thank you for saying across the board. So we'll actually by looking at um, Africa's projected growth rate and how that trickles down into Nigeria. Um, so for starters, Africa's growth, we're projecting a growth rate just still um, alongside what the IMF is projecting and what the African Development Bank is projecting. Okay. So Africa's growth rate is projected around 3 to 4%. Yeah. And this growth, uh, growth rate projection is actually centered around the growth um, across the continent. So we try not to look at Africa as a, con as a country, okay. ensuring that we take into consideration the uniqueness and the various characteristics and also policy interventions in various other economies and how that feeds into Africa's growth. So starting from like 2023, where the global economy did come out, did uh, face a, a, a turbulent period um, from global monetary tightening, um, inflationary pressures, yeah. All of this fed into um, uh, uh, Africa's economies and then fed into the entire outlook for the region. So that's why our outlook for, for Africa is quite uh, conservative, though still optimistic. Then now looking at the various regions that are feeding into this um, growth outlook for Africa, because even though it's a bit conservative, it's still better than what um, we, are, we, we projected for 2023 and even what has happened in 2023. So the bright spots in Africa right now are the EA series, that's the East Africa community. Yeah. We're also seeing some bright spots in Central Africa, in the Central Africa region and we're also seeing um, some countries in West Africa take the lead there and that, a perfect example there is um, Ivory Coast but speaking on the East African community we're seeing countries like Kenya Rwanda and Tanzania actually maintaining their stellar growth rates Wow yes um, for Kenya you know Kenya has a eurobond repayment for 2024 and still we we expect the country to maintain its growth rate of around five to five point five percent and this is because we're seeing a rebound in the agricultural sector and tourism sector and the growth in the tourism sector we see that spreading into um, the other countries in the region then looking at the um, central african region we've seen an increase in investor appetite mm. towards that region simply because um, some of the countries there are beginning to revamp their oil and gas sector, the natural gas sector, the extractive industries, and the general manufacturing uh, um, industry. So we're seeing a lot of the governments there being proactive in terms of boosting the value um, chain of their cultural sector and um, harnessing more of their um, mineral resources and our cultural commodities. Then for West Africa, Ivory Coast is just a shining light right now. Mm -hmm. um, yes, even though they're trying to, right now they're also trying to venture into the Eurobond market. Okay. That's the first of its First of that nature since two years ago, since the you know, international capital market has been shot to African countries. So clearly, um, Ivory Coast, we're, we're expecting Ivory Coast growth rate to actually be above um, the general um, Africa's uh, growth rate and the okay. entire um, sub-Saharan sub African region's uh, growth rate. So Ivory Coast is projected to grow out around 6 to 6.5 percent, and, and that's a very strong growth rate for a West African uh, country. Now, looking at... Um, Nigeria and South Africa, which are the dominant economies in Africa by GDP. Yeah. Yeah, we expect the big ones. exactly the big the big goons. <laughs> yeah. So Nigeria's growth rate is still expected to be sluggish at around two to two point five percent. That's the average growth rate for twenty twenty four. Wow. And the reason why we expect this is just coming off the back of um the reforms that Nigeria has undertaken. True. So these reforms will definitely stifle, uh, will continue to stifle consumer spending and also um, the output from businesses. But towards the second half of the year, we might see things uh, pick up a bit. For South Africa, still expecting sluggish growth rates, underperforming under performing the SSA um, average, average growth rates for the region, simply because of its lingering power crisis. And there are also... Um, there's also the risk premium for its uh, political instability, simply because of the elections that are coming up 
um, somewhat uh, later in the year. So those are, that's the overall, overall outlook, yes, for the growth rates for, for African um, uh, specific countries in the region. Brilliant. Uh, but let, let, let's stay home before yes. we now uh, <laughs> look at what's happening. Of Many course. would say the CBN is yet to come out with a blueprint mm -hmm. of what really the direction of the monetary policy would be. We're yet to even have an MPC meeting. We yes. hope that date will come up anytime soon. But what's your expectations really? What are you expecting from the Cardoso led CBN? Yeah, to be very honest, um, we expect it a strict reversal from what we've seen in the past oh, eight no. years. Yeah, so um, the, the CBN uh, in the past eight years, or almost even a decade ago, was very unorthodox in its approaches to um, liquidity management and um, price stability measures. So we're expecting that the CBN this time around, under the new leadership, will be quite different from what we've experienced before. And even though we haven't yet seen a blueprint, like you rightly said, on the CBN's monetary policy direction, yes. we have... Um, send signals that the CBN is going to be significantly different this time around. Um, for one, we've seen the, the CBN um, remove the $2 billion uh, uh, cap on um, standard deposit facility for banks. We've also seen the removal of the um, import restrictions for, sure. some commodity, uh, for, sure. for some commodities. We've also seen the CBN allowing automobile rates to significantly increase. Towards uh, uh, the NPR, we've also seen treasury bill rates also increase significantly from where they were before. And we're also seeing, like you also mentioned, one of the highlights today, the CBN is actively clearing yes, the yes, FX backlog. Yes, backlog. So even if um, we haven't had an official announcement that this is what the CBN is doing, we've had some level of commitments um, from the CIBN uh, uh, um, yeah, speech. Yes, yeah, that dinner. Yes, the CIBN <laughs> speech. And we're also seeing True. the CBN make these moves, um, um, I would say, underground and also somewhat public. Mm. to signal positively that it's going to be orthodox. But the key thing here for, for monetary policy is that we find, or the CBN actually maintains, that, maintains the uh, um, dollar inflows into the economy to stabilize the exchange rate. Because we've seen over time that currency depreciation is the anchor right now, is the umbrella of which all things are somewhat falling apart in the economy. It's affecting businesses and that as well oh. is increasing prices, increasing prices and squeezing consumer demand. And the reason why this is significantly important is because the longer we waste time to address, the, um, uh, to address our Nigeria's lingering issues that are affecting commodity prices and the general economy, the, the, the easier it is for speculation and speculative attacks to continue mm -hmm. and investors being disincentivized. Mm -hmm. We need as much dollar inflows as we can get into the economy, and that starts by positively anchoring investor sentiment. So what the CBN is doing without actually outrightly saying this is what, this we're, is what doing, we're doing is, is somewhat positively anchoring investor sentiments. But the moment they make that announcement, hopefully we ha they have their meeting towards the end of this month, and then there's a clear direction on where they're going. So that's where I see, uh, that's where we see monetary policy for now. Let's move to Kenya and understand the macroeconomic issues around that space that will shape the year. There's been bold steps by uh, the president too. What are you looking at in that space? I mean, for Kenya, it's just the euro bond, euro bond, euro bond. Um, the euro bond uh, repayment for 2024 is significantly reshaping um, Kenya's macroeconomic landscape. Everything right now, at least for the first half of the year, will be definitely tilted towards ensuring that that repayment happens. And it happens uh, at the time it's supposed to happen, including the interest payments on that bond. Um, the significant thing here, this just, just off the news today, the IMF has concluded um, another review on the IMF on the Kenyan economy and is you know, and has agreed to, you know, support the, the country further with uh, additional, with additional uh, um, um, dollar inflows. So that as well will support the country's uh, eurobond maturity. We expect Kenya to um, um, meet that eurobond obligation in June 2024. But before that happens, we still expect currency pressures to persist in the Kenyan economy, at least up until the, the euro bond uh, is paid. Right now, Kenya's currency, at least between 2023 and uh, as of today, Kenya's currency has already depreciated yet to date about 23% uh, against mm. the US dollar. And this has been a two-year losing streak for the country. That's since 2022. Um, we expect that to continue at least until the euro bond is paid. In terms of inflation, we see inflation tapering out mm. for Kenya. Um, thankfully, Stairs' uh, Stairs' inflation forecast has been quite accurate for for uh, um, predicting Kenya's inflation. 
we have three scenarios, the baseline scenario, the BS scenario, and the bull scenario. And Kenya's inflation has consistently remained within our baseline and uh, um, bull scenario, meaning that inflation has remained within the, CB, the CBKs, that's the Central Bank of Kenya's um, inflation target, um, of about 5 plus or minus 2.5%. And we expect that trend to continue um, throughout the year because uh, food, food inflation, we expect it to also taper because our cultural sector is rebounding. And we also, we also expect um, dollar inflows to keep coming in for the country. So that is one of the things that is feeding into Kenya's inflation uh, uh, prospects. It's quite optimistic, and we expect that to actually happen. Then in terms of growth rate, like I mentioned earlier, Kenya is one of the bright spots for the East African community. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. is the gateway for... Um, for, for uh, uh, even venture funding towards um, the East, Af East African community. We're seeing a lot of countries or, and a lot of investments towards uh, um, Kenya. We expect that trend to continue. Kenya's growth rate is expected uh, at, at, an, at an optimistic 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 for 2024. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think will be the trend of global consumer spending, uh, of course, in Sub-Saharan Africa and the global economy? So for the global economy, so I'll break this down into okay, the global no SSA and then for um, the various countries. Okay. For um, the global economy, we, we expect a rebound in uh, consumer spending simply because you know, the global economy is rebounding. For instance, inflation in the U.S. has significantly yeah. reduced closer True. to um, the U.S. Fed's target of around 2%, even though it did increase in December, but we attributed that to um, festive spending. Of course, yes. of course. So we, yeah. we generally expect the economy to rebound. The U.K. as well is seeing a significant slowdown in inflation um, from around about a 41-year high of about 9% or even 10%. In 2022, inflation is down now to about 3.9% in the UK. Same thing for um, China as well. We're seeing that um, consumer spending in China could somewhat pick up, even though China is still facing its fair share of um, challenges from its property sector crisis. Yeah. But generally, the outlook for the global economy is positive, and we expect that trend to continue. So we're going to see a rebound in consumer spending. But um, for, um, for consumers globally, household, uh, housing, food, um, transportation will take a huge chunk of uh, Consumer, consumer spending, take a huge chunk of uh, the consumer basket. Now coming to Africa, or Sub-Saharan Africa yeah. now, we expect consumers to still remain very price conscious, simply because um, prices are still very elevated. Um, even though we expect inflation to somewhat reduce, um, the IMF projects um, um, Sub-Saharan Africa's inflation to slow down a bit, about 13% from 15.8% um, last year. But still, commodity prices are still high in various countries. So meaning that consumers will still remain uh, very price sensitive and um, very uh, price conscious. Now coming into uh, Nigeria, Nigeria, it's pretty much the same as the sub-Saharan consumer. Um, consumers will definitely continue to prioritize um, uh, consumption on food, and basically for survival, um, just to ensure that they're able to stay within their budget constraints and their um, Lower, their, their lower disposable income. But the significant thing here for um, African consumers and Nigerian consumers is that they're actually split between two spectrums. Okay. That is the upper income consumers, those are consumers that are earning about $10,000 to, to over a million dollars yeah. annually. And then you have the um, entry level consumers, and that, re that includes people that are earning less than $10,000 annually, and a floating class of people earning about two to uh, four, four dollars um, on a daily basis. So, so on, on, a, on a monthly basis, sorry. So um, basically, it just simply means that most of Nigeria's consumers are still fit into, fixed into that entry level category, and we see them exhibit these characteristics of trying to make sure that they balance their spending to focus yeah, on true. the necessities than spending on luxury items. But for the upper income consumers in Nigeria that have consistently lived above you know, um, the, the uh, spending threshold, we expect them to maintain their consumption um, mm -hmm. for luxury items. They remain brand loyal. But then again, a significant thing that is changing in that consumer class is that their spending on food items um, would actually increase. So if in their um, consumer basket, they usually would spend maybe 30% of their, um, of their income on yeah. food. Now that has of increased course. about 40% 40, or 45%. It, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just a, a yeah, hypothetical example. But that's pretty much it for the consumer yeah. landscape. Yeah. But, but, but where are the opportunities now? Because in all of this, there's still opportunities. Of course. Where do we have these opportunities and how can we take advantage of them? Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, the opportunities in Africa... 
um, still exist largely within the East African region. Nigeria as well is a bright spot in terms of the reforms that we've taken place. Um, so that is a key thing that has happened and put Nigeria on the map for or on the, on the uh, landscape for investors to you know, significantly watch out for. Um, and one of the reasons that, one of the things that has prompted this um, somewhat optimistic outlook in terms of the investment climate is um, the increase in um, Nigeria stock exchange. If you notice that there was a significant re um, yes. um, rebound in, in the, the equity, markets. equities yeah. market, yes. one yes. of the best performing globally. Yes. And so clearly meaning that there is somewhat of an incentive mm. to, for investors to rebalance their portfolio in favor of um, developing economies and emerging markets like Nigeria. Nigeria. The other bright spots are the fact that we are also expecting that the global monetary policy easing would probably start towards the end of the year, and that might, you know, um, push investors to, you know, reconsider the emerging markets and developing economies that they always usually favor for higher yields. And again, um, Kenya is one of the bright spots here. Ghana as well is, uh, has received some green light because of its uh, IMF standing, sticking oh, to the yeah, reforms. Yes, yeah, so that's a bright spot that we're also looking at as well. South Africa too, um, simply because uh, they're already undertaking the necessary steps to address the power crisis. South Africa is one of the uh, relatively stable economies in, in in, uh, in Africa, and that is not going to change in one year. So there, there are still some um, bright spots for that um, country, for the country as well. So generally, uh, it's just that generally, if you're going to pinpoint the the brighter spots amongst everything I've mentioned here, is still within the East African community. Hmm. The energy market is very important to watch out. We mm -hmm. need to see what's happening, especially now the transition thing, gas, and all of that. Yes. So where do you see? Uh, that uh, consider even the wars in Ukraine mm -hmm. and all of that, mm -hmm. where do you see that market? How do you see it performing in 2024? I mean, um, looking at it from the global standing with the events that are currently happening, clearly there is some sentiment for oil prices to remain bullish, at least for the first quarter of this year, because of the war that is happening now, the Houthis issue, the Red Sea crisis, yes. um, the lingering Russia and Ukraine war, and general um, price uh, supply, supply uh, um, um, shortages from OPEC. Um, you know now OPEC, um, Angola has exited OPEC, so OPEC's global contribution to oil supply has also reduced. reduced and yeah. still the cartel remains very conservative to try to keep oil prices at around $80 per barrel. So generally the sentiments towards oil prices, at least for the first quarter of the year, is that prices would remain high. And what this means for Nigeria, especially looking at uh, the, the crisis, it's, it's, it's twofold. So there's the impact of oil prices on the Nigerian economy and the impact of the supply chain disruptions that are, um, that are ensuing due to the um, uh, Red Sea crisis and also even the Russian-Ukraine war towards the Nigerian economy. So looking at the oil price impact, with higher global oil, pri oil prices, there are, um, there's a possibility that Nigeria could earn more in terms of revenue simply because, you know, it's one oil production, oil producing country. We should be able to generate more income with global oil prices trending higher. However, for Nigeria, the, Nigeria's revenue and generally the income that we make from crude oil sales and exports is highly, it's, it's more sensitive to changes in Nigeria's oil production than prices. So if we have oil production trending lower, chances are that we will not be able to take advantage of higher global oil prices. prices yeah. And we've seen this happen. This happened last year when countries like Angola and Saudi Arabia were raking in so much profit due to oil prices being higher. Nigeria did not have that testimony. Yeah. But we're expecting things to change, but in a very gradual way. Um, we're also seeing like oil production trending higher, but then again, it will be a very gradual process. Nigeria's oil production might still underperform um, OPEC's quota of, the, the now revised quota of about 1.5 million barrels per day, at least for the first quarter of the year. Um, but generally, if we do make money in terms of Naira terms, we would see FAC disbursements, that's the amount of money distributed to state governments, local governments, and also the federal government, federal government yeah. we would see that increase in Naira terms. The trend has been happening um, since 2023, and we expect that to continue in 2024 in Naira terms. Then, um, when we look at the supply chain disruptions, yeah. Nigeria is still quite import dependent for quite a number of commodities like wheat. Um, and we expect that trend to continue simply because um, by template and by experience, we've seen that 
um, when global supply chain disruptions happen like this, especially with the Suez Canal that did happen in 2021, um, global commodity prices, especially grains like wheat, uh, uh, millet, and all of that, tend to trend high, and also uh, um, edible oils. And Nigeria is a large importer of those commodities. So with those prices trending higher, we would see imported inflation probably increase because our import bill has also increased. That would filter into um, other derivatives for certain products like wheat, like bread, um, um, pasta, noodles. The prices of those commodities could trend higher. Mm -hmm. Oh, finally, our time is fast spent, and I'm so enjoying this conversation. <laughs> but let's wrap up with the financial sector stability. Yes. You know everybody wants to hear about that. What's happening in that space, and what are you thinking? Is there any cause for alarm? Yeah, so... Disclaimer, I'm not a financial services uh, <laughs> expert, I know that. But, but then again, um, the general uh, um, um, outlook for there is yes. just, we're still quite optimistic okay. about um, the, the financial services sector, especially for banking. We know that one of the reasons why the NGX was very, uh, was, was, uh, was one of the best performing globally is because of the banking sector. True. So we expect that trend to continue, especially with the fact that, like I did mention, we're expecting a more orthodox monetary policy, and that should definitely filter into the uh, um, um, the financial services sector, especially with, and, and now we're also seeing like fintechs also brooding. Yeah. There are some bright spots there as well for, for Nigeria and even Kenya as well. We hope to have you on the show anytime soon again. Thank you so much. Thank really interesting so much having you on the show, me. Mrs. Dume B. Oduwe. Let me get a handshake there. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. That was a good one. Uh, she you. is a senior economist with STIRS. Thank you for breaking down this uh, very beautiful document. Well detailed. Thank you so Enjoy much. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. All Thank right. There. Coming up on the show, let's move to the oil and gas industry where Shell is set to exit Nigeria's troubled onshore after nearly a century. Executive Director Policy Alert, Mr. Tijar Bolton 